and welcome everyone. I'm Coco Huff. I'm going to take a few minutes just to find myself on the computer and, um, and wait for a few people to show up and then we will get started. I usually have a few seconds delay before I see myself on here. How's everyone doing? I don't know if anyone's out there yet. Um, I hope you're all doing okay on this snowy, snowy week. What a week it's been, where, where I am at least. Hi, David. Hello. Is it snowy where you are? I imagine it is. I don't know. You're in more of like a city. I just started noticing on videos that I make this face. And I think you make that face sometimes too. Mmm, shepherd's pie, yes. Shepherd's pie is so good. I can't wait to talk about this tonight. So there are two of you. Let me know. Um, let me know that you're here. And I'm excited to see you tonight. Send me emojis of the weather where you are. I want to know. I want to know if there's anyone. Um, yeah, David says it's pretty gross out. I want to know if there's anyone who's like sun and palm trees right now so I can just live vicariously through you that would be that would be great <laughs> or depressing I'm not sure which but anyway we are doing comfort food tonight because of the weather because we had another we, we had two feet of snow already we had another six inches uh, two days ago I think and uh, there's more on the way so last week we did a French onion soup nice warm savory soup and today we're doing a shepherd's pie so let me back up a second. David sent me a snowflake. That pretty much sums up the weather where we are. That's true. Um, so I am Coco Huff, C-O-C-O-H-O-U-G-H for CocoHuff.com. I am also on YouTube, Instagram. We're on Facebook right now. I have some blooper reels on TikTok that I think are pretty funny. And, um, and we've been doing this for 21 weeks plus some breaks. So 21 videos so far on Tuesday nights. So, um, and we just talk about everything to do with kitchen design, with cooking, with equipment in your kitchen, um, you know, how to do different techniques to make everything you're cooking the most delicious it can be and the most stress-free and um, easy for you. So I think as we gather an arsenal of techniques over time, you know, cooking becomes easier and more fun and more creative and all that. So that's why we're here. And I just, oh, hello, Helene. Uh, Helene is in Kentucky. Ice storm expected. I thought it was maybe a little bit warmer in Kentucky, so maybe that's not true. So I hope you stay warm and safe as well. And I'm glad you're here. So I wanted to say one other thing. Last week I mentioned that I will be cooking or teaching for the um, Ridgewood Community School, which is true, that's starting in April. I will post something about that on my page. But I failed to mention that this came about because Stacy, who's been here almost every week, had me on her big screen TV doing the turkey video, and she posted about it, and then someone saw it, and um, it went from there. So I first of all wanted to say thank you to Stacy. I really appreciate that. And also if any of you are so inclined, I would love it if you would share with your friends. I know um, Kimba and Teresa have told some people and I am just thrilled about that. So I thank you and um, you know, the more the merrier. So that would be really great. Um, speaking of Teresa, hello, good to see you. I'm glad you're here too. All right, so I could just stand here all night and talk. We are going to make a shepherd's pie. This is a traditional dish. It's a um, meat filling and base, a savory, warm meat filling with gravy and a potato, mashed potato topping. And we'll talk a bit about where that originated and everything as we go. But first we're going to start with our potatoes because that takes the longest to, uh, to get going. So my oven fan is going right now still from cooking the other one that we're going to pull out and hopefully that will stop soon. So I hope you can hear me pretty clearly. Um, 
We've made mashed potatoes once before, and let me stop one, one more thing before I go on. If you have any questions, if you have any comments, if you know any history about this, whatever it is, chat me up in the um, comments section, and I'm here to answer questions, and I, I love getting more information about food all the time. So, um, all right, we have our potatoes. We have two pounds of potatoes here. In this case, it was these three large ones. Earlier, I had eight small ones. You know, I just weighed them out. Um, but whatever looks right to you, you know, per person, this feeds about six altogether. I've scrubbed them and I'm cutting them into, eh, that was a, like golf ball size, uniform pieces. So they'll cook faster and so they'll cook about the same. I'm not peeling them yet. We're going to push them through the ricer and the peel will come off then. So actually we need some water in here. Filling this pan up about halfway. And I'll add some salt. We always want to salt our potatoes as we go. Um, if you try to salt them at the end, they never taste salty enough. So some salt into this pan. And potatoes always start in cold water. I'm gonna do this in thirds this time, sorry. In cold water, so that the temperature is like of the potato and the water is coming up together as opposed to blasting them for boiled potatoes at least and mashed potatoes um, instead of blasting them with heat and then the outside would cook and the inside would still be hard and it would be much more difficult to manage all right i'm putting this on high heat to come up to a boil not too much water let me show you how much water i have in here like half otherwise by the time the water comes up to temperature you know we'll be here all night Kimba says, hi, love shepherd's pie. I know, it's such a good one, right? It's, it's a, another, I think I say that all the time, but it's it's easy, it's comforting. Um, it's just such a delicious dish. I'm wearing like stretchy pants and slippers tonight. Um, I won't out anybody, but we were talking today about how we're all like comfort eating right now. It's, it's enough of the cold weather and being home. Um, we all need a little bit of soothing right now. Okay, so my potatoes are in here. This is coming up to temperature. Those will boil for a while and we'll mash them. I'm gonna move this over actually to this burner. I forgot to get my pan out. All right. Pretend you didn't see that I put my nonstick pan in the dishwasher. I just sometimes do. I'm like, I have too much going on. Okay, so a shepherd's pie is typically lamb. If you make it with beef, if you just don't prefer lamb, or if that's what you have on hand, um, it's called a cottage pie. So it's perfectly acceptable to do. Um, but a shepherd's pie, because they're the shepherds with the sheep, is lamb. I happen to love lamb, um, so I'm happy with that. And I know not everyone does, though. So. Teresa sent me a smile face. I know this comfort eating business is, uh, is for real. So here's the lamb. This is ground lamb in a pan. And I'm just kind of trying to get as much surface area as possible onto the pan so we can brown it. The whole purpose of cooking this ahead of time is to have the browning and the extra flavor as opposed to if you just had it sort of in a liquidy mixture. And that will make the whole thing more delicious. All right, so we're spreading this around. Let it stay on one side for a while. And the reason we start with the meat is sort of to manage how much fat is going to come out of this. So I did lamb, I experimented with like a lamb chili for the Super Bowl and I sauteed it like this. And I'll just, let me show you how much fat came out of it. Like I saved it in this fat separator. I thought, oh, it'll be half fat and half liquid and then I'll pour the liquid back in, which I frequently do with stews and chilies and stuff. Um, it was 100% fat. So lamb fat is the only kind I don't save. I just don't, it just doesn't have as, like I love lamb, but the fat isn't as, um, what's the word? I don't know. It's just not as good as like a beef fat or pork fat. It has a heavier mouth feel. So we're going to see what comes out of this and manage it. If we need a little bit less, a little more, you know, you want some for the flavor. Helene says this is her daughter's favorite comfort food. I know. 
So good. This and chicken pot pie. We might do a chicken pot pie sometime. That's also really good. All right, that is hot. Last time I wasn't sure about a burner, we had problems going on. All right, while that's cooking, we're going to cut up our vegetables. I have just one large onion here and the carrot. This is really, the whole origin of this dish was use up what you have, use up, it was actually to use up roasted meat. Um, and the most accurate I could get in terms of a time frame was just like in ancient cooking. Um, but if you had roasted meat, of course nobody threw anything away. So they would mix it with the vegetables and make a gravy and, um, and make this pie out of it. So, and then the story I read was that was done in England with beef. There wasn't really a lot of beef in Ireland. And then, you know, as different back and forth went on over the ages, um, the recipe was brought to Ireland and then was adapted to lamb. So what was I saying though? Oh, what my point was is that it's a recipe that was born of using up what you have. So if you have these vegetables, use these vegetables. If you have other ones, throw those in too. Um, but of course, always an onion. That's always delicious. All right, we're gonna cut our onion the way we always do, which is carefully with your fingers on top, horizontal to the board. Two times, this is a pretty big onion. Sometimes I stand it up like this, just be careful. I get the knife in there first and then stand it up. I feel like this knife might need to be sharpened soon, so we'll do that, but not right now. Um, so we went across ways, and now we're going to cut downwards. And now across this way. And now you have magical diced onion. way to cut an onion and have it all be sort of uniform. So we've talked about this before, the idea of, you know, before you start a dish, kind of thinking through what size pieces you want. So whether it's a stuffing or the strata or a stew, you know, how big do you want the pieces to be when you're actually eating it? And in this case, to me, what seems the most appealing is everything sort of pea-sized, like, because uh, we traditionally peas go into this dish. So the ground beef, when it cooks, kind of crumbles to that size. The peas, uh, we're putting corn in there. So everything sort of uniform across the board. Feels like it will be the most pleasant to eat. All right, so we're gonna cook our vegetables in a minute. But um, let's see. Let's stir our meat. Oh, I put some salt on that meat. Diana, how are you? Diana said this is also, oops, I shouldn't have turned that quite yet. It's not really brown, so let's just leave the rest of it for a minute, as you can see. Diana says this is also one of her favorites. I'm so glad that everyone really loves it. I hope you'll try it. Send me pictures of what you make. Um, that always makes me happy. Okay, we have a carrot. This has also been scrubbed. I don't tend to peel carrots unless we're going for some fancy presentation um, where it needs to look nice on the outside. I think it's just easier and the nutrients are in that outside part, so I leave them. I cut the ends off, cut it into thirds, and so it's easier to deal with. And then you know, insert the knife before you push down. And now just kind of eyeball if you want thirds or halves on the large end. Sometimes they're really large and you would want thirds always with the flat side down to the board. And that's pretty good, okay. And then 
and just a little dice across like that. You could do two carrots if you want. This was a pretty big one. I'd love to know what of your, everyone's saying this is their favorite comfort food. I would love to know what are some other of your favorite comfort foods um, for the winter weather, just like home alone type food. I know soups are always popular. Okay, we have our carrot. That's all going in that bowl. And just some garlic. I'm just putting this all my scraps into a bowl that will go into compost. Um, I usually save the onions and stuff for stock, but my freezer is so full. It's, it's not going to work, so they're going into compost. Um, I actually bought this, so we smush our garlic clove like that with the knife. I cut the root end off first and then smashed. Um, I bought this new vacuum seal system that has dishwasher safe vacuum seal bags for food. That I'm going to try. So, like, if I if you have our, your shrimp tails or um, all your onion peels, chicken bones, that kind of thing, it's just I constantly have so much of that. So I can make different stocks, but I don't always make the stock right away. So I'm going to do a separate video. I'm way behind on separate recording videos, but I will do one kind of unboxing that and see if it works. It seems like fun. Okay, garlic. That was just one really big clove of garlic. All right, everything into the bowl. Our potatoes are starting to simmer over here. I hope I cut them small enough. We'll see. I'm going to put a lid on that, actually. I'll be right back. I'm going to put a lid so they cook a little bit faster. We don't want to wait for that. Okay. On the potatoes. Let's check the meat. What's going on over here? Okay, some browning is happening. I think the challenge is, you know, when you're browning meat, like for a stew, the most important thing is to not let the pieces touch each other. And we've done that before. We did that beef stew one time because you'll never get brown. They'll just let go of their liquid. So when you have brown beef, of course, they're touching each other. So it takes a while to get to that brown part. All right, so I'm breaking it up with this spatula. All right, I didn't mention the mashed potatoes we're going to add. They're going to be cheesy mashed potatoes, which I love. You can't go wrong with that. And this was a pound and a half of lamb. And like I said, it could be beef too. Alright, let that go for a few more seconds. This is a good thing. You can add it to any stew, any uh, casserole. It adds richness. And that, I didn't call for it for tonight, but that would be a good addition here. It just adds another level of richness. And same with tomato paste. Tomato paste adds depth of flavor. That would also be good in here. But we're doing sort of the most basic variety. Uh, but if you have those things on hand, just throw them in. So I'm thinking I'm gonna do at some point like a, two different things, a pantry staple, Worcestershire sauce, tomato sauce, beans, all the things that you, it, it would be helpful to have in your kitchen. And um, I often find if I wanna make a pasta, or if I wanna make a stew, I have what I need in the house most of the time. I mean, not in great amounts, but I keep those things replenished. So I thought maybe that would be a fun video. And another one was um, 
like cooking equipment, all my favorite things that I grab. I probably, it's like the 80-20 rule. You know, there's probably that 20% that I grab every day and use over and over again um, so that I never think about it. I just have the tools I need. And then there's the other 80% that's for creme brulee, the torches, that type of stuff that you don't use every day. Okay, how are we doing here? We're getting pretty browned. Not a lot of like caramelizing yet, but we may have to move on. Let's see here. And of course, this is cooking again in the pie. So the idea here is really to render out the fat and brown a little bit, not to worry about cooking it all the way through. All right, so like we do with stews and things, we're going to cook things, take them out, put them back, you know, that type of thing, we're cooking um, in stages. So this beef, lamb, sorry, not beef, is going into this bowl. Whoops, this beef, this, how many times am I going to say beef? This lamb is going all over the counter, is what I was going to say. <laughs> okay, um, I'm just using this slotted spatula to leave the fat in the pan. Okay, and a lot of what's left behind, I think that's mostly fat. Sometimes there's liquid and it will bubble up more. And um, kind of cook off, you know, the fat won't evaporate, but the liquid will. So most of what we have here is fat. I don't think it's too much necessarily. Let's take a look. That was probably not the right tool. I think a slotted spoon would have served me better here. <laughs> um, just to get that out more quickly. All right, we have some fat. We want some fat, of course. We want that lamb flavor. If you had a lot, like I showed you in the, uh, so this is about two tablespoons, which I would say is as much as you would want. So we're gonna leave that, we'll cook our vegetables. If you had a lot, you could pour it into your fat separator like I did over there or you can just take a paper towel and some tongs and swirl this around and have it absorb the fat and throw it in the trash so I frequently you know if my pan is too much in it I'll just do that all right our carrots onions and garlic are going in now stir that in and actually earlier when I made one I had to add a little bit more fat at this point so because you want your onions to be frying, not dry, or they won't cook properly. So some olive oil. I'm sure there are uses for lamb fat. I mean, people make candles and whatnot out of, <laughs> out of fat. I just don't know what those uses are. I'm not that advanced. I'm not making candles out of the rendered fat, but maybe I should. <laughs> Um, okay, a little salt. We want to salt each each um, component as we go, and a little pepper. Okay. And that looks really nice already. I love the pieces of carrots and the pieces of onion. Salting helps them all release their liquid more quickly also, so they cook more evenly, you know, and generally taste better too. Okay. And then let's look at what else we have here. So we have some corn. This is like half a bag, it's about two cups of frozen corn. If we were doing this in the summer, you could cut corn off the cob if you had leftover. Um, at some point, we'll talk about how to do that and get the most corn off of the cob like that. We have peas. Peas are 100% the traditional way to go with the shepherd's pie. I'm going to pretend I'm putting them in. I actually love peas, but my daughter is allergic to peas, believe it or not. So I'm going to leave them out. Um, 
and instead I'm going to put some chopped arugula. So we're going to do that now. And that will sort of give it still the green appearance. Where am I putting this? Um, you know, and like the extra amount of uh, volume that the peas would give. I actually really love it with peas, so I highly recommend that. I just, we wouldn't be able to eat it. So um, Regina asked, she said, that's a nice size pan. What kind is it? This is, it's called Scan Pan, S-C-A-N, Scan Pan. And I've had several of these. I mean, I haven't yet found a non-stick pan that really lasts forever. And they always start out strong um, and then eventually lose their non-stick properties. But th these seem to last for a couple of years. I like the size of it. I like the um, height of it as well. And I've, I've been putting links to the equipment I use in the video, so I'll put a link to this one tonight. But Scam Pan, they are great. Um, I, I have two of this size, actually, because once they're not so non-stick, you can still use it for other things. You just can't use it for like omelets and eggs and stuff like that. You could easily still use it for this. All right, this is baby arugula. I'm kind of balling it up into a smaller piece so I can get smaller pieces out of it. Chop across this way. And then I'm going to turn it 90 degrees, ball it back up again, because we just don't want like a long string of arugula in the pie. And just as a reminder, this is my replacement for peas, but you could do both really, the arugula and the peas, if you like that. I tend to throw arugula into a lot of things because it's healthy, it tastes good. And we're also going to chop some parsley. So this is a beautiful bunch of fresh parsley. Generally, if you're taking a lot of leaves, kind of shave the parsley that way. I'm not going to do too much right now, but wash, wash it first because parsley can be very sandy and then shave downwards around the, the bunch and then remove any extra stems you have there. So Regina, I see that you're here. Um, we were talking about Irish butter. Regina's family is from Ireland. I'm wondering if this is something people still traditionally eat in Ireland. Yeah, that was my research, but I would love to know that. That would be interesting. All right, we're gonna chop our parsley. So I did one rough chop, and then the best way to chop herbs like this, let me stir quickly actually. The best way with your big chef's knife is the chef's knife should rock on the board. And one of the reasons for that, besides cutting carrots and things like this, is um, to go through your herbs like this. Just gather them up, go through them, gather them that way. And it's just one of the ways that your cooking becomes more efficient when you're chopping like that. So I'm really holding this end down and using it as a pivot point for chopping. Okay. So I'm talking a lot, so this would really not take you very long. All we've done is cut up some potatoes, brown some meat, onions, carrots, uh, some vegetables, and we're almost done, really. So we're going to add our peas and carrots. Not our peas and carrots, we already did carrots. Our corn into this mixture. We would be adding our peas, so pretend that that just went in, and my daughter will be happy because she would not be able to eat this if I did it. Um, let me stir the corn before I add the arugula, because the arugula is going to wilt really quickly. Okay, Regina says, oh nice. Regina says you can still get this in most pubs in Ireland, and that it's a favorite of her husband and daughter's. So that's nice. I like when you like learn about where things are from. And I like when they're authentic too. It's not like we just made this up in America. Um, okay, I have our fresh parsley. I'm adding a little bit of dried parsley as well. And that was not helpful to you. That was about a teaspoon. So, and I'll do the same with my thyme. About a teaspoon of thyme. 
I meant to do rosemary, but I usually grab it from my garden and I forgot that my garden is under two feet of snow. So some rosemary would be great in there as well. You always want to sort of cook your herbs or your spices in the hot pan before you add any liquid or things. And now our arugula and parsley are going in. And give that a quick stir. It looks beautiful already, right? All right, just wilt the arugula down a little bit um, so that it doesn't add too much liquid to the final, the final product. Okay, more pepper, we'll taste for salt and pepper in a second. All right, so we have all of this and we're going to combine it with our meat. So before I do that, this is actually the step I forgot for a second with the French onion soup, is we're going to add a little bit of flour to the meat. So we do it with something like we were, we were going to add the flour to the cooked down onions, not to the finished soup, so that it, it disperses itself more easily when you then mix in other things. Um, so we're mixing it, we're adding it at this point to our cooked beef. This is two tablespoons of flour. And then, you know, you can just sort of toss it around and it won't clump like it clumped. Oh, I just touched the hot pan. Um, you know, it would sort of clump if this were wet. And the purpose for that is to thicken our gravy. So that flour will take our beef stock and thicken it when this is cooking in the oven. Okay, and now all of our hot vegetables are going in here as well. So I saw some... Um, beautiful, this is probably going to get me banned from Ireland, <laughs> um, some beautiful vegetarian versions when I was researching recipes, but they just looked good. I like when you can get a lot of richness of flavor into things, you know, vegetarian or not. So there were things like lentil, mushroom, tomato paste, all those like deep flavors together with then the same um, potato topping. I thought that looked really good. You know, if you chop up your mushrooms and add some cooked lentils, that's going to be delicious anyway. So that was worth trying someday. Okay, let's let this cool for a second while we talk about potatoes. They are boiling away. I'm going to check on them. This is always like the iffy part. Like, are they going to be ready to go in time? All right. Uh, let's see. Let me get rid of this. and move our potatoes to this burner. To work with them. That's hot. Okay. Let's see how they're doing. They are boiling away. pretty soft. I think I'm just going to let them boil for another minute while we prepare what's going into them. So the um, this the vegetable beef, why do I keep saying beef? Really? Okay. Vegetable lamb. All right. That's going to go into my blooper reel if I say it one more time. Uh, mixture is going in the bottom of our pie pan. The, the uh, potatoes are going on top and we'll grate some cheese into them. So this is an aged cheddar which I just thought was really beautiful and will add nice flavor. This is about a quarter of a pound, so we're going to grate it right now. Okay. The other day I kept calling tuna salmon. I just kept looking at it and it was pink and I kept thinking salmon. I'm like, stop saying salmon, it is tuna. I do know the difference. <laughs> But the lamb and the beef, of course, look very much alike. Okay, we have our quarter pound of 
braided cheddar. going to rice our potatoes. So I tend to use, I find this to be one of the essential tools. I don't use it every day, but a potato ricer like this, just a stainless steel one, makes a much easier job of mashing potatoes. I have had the one that you push the, it has like this kind of end on it. Um, I guess it's called a potato masher. That also works, but this is the, the most surefire way to get absolutely smooth potatoes with no lumps. So a potato ricer, very useful thing, but I don't like to say you can't make this if you don't have a potato ricer. Obviously a masher is fine, um, a fork is fine, you know, it would just maybe be, not be quite as smooth, but that's fine. You're making it for yourself. It should be what you like and it should be not stressful. So, all right, we're going to just clean off this board and then strain the potatoes and see what we can do. And they are going to be very hot, so hopefully I can do it. Okay. All right, potatoes getting strained. So I tend to just um, rice them right back into this hot pot which also helps evaporate any water that's in there and make them then more likely to take up the milk and the cream and the butter and all those good things that we're putting in there. Okay, I'm stalling slightly because A, I want them to be finished and B, they're really hot. Let me just test them. Oh yeah, they're, they're, that fork just went right through. They're totally ready. How long was that? They, that was about 20 minutes boiling. Maybe that was more than enough, actually. Okay, so like I said, these have their skins on, but the ricer kind of pushes everything through and leaves the skins behind, so it's easy to just um, scrape out each one. So after each squeeze, scrape out the skin and put it to the side. I do about two pieces at, the t at a time. You don't want to overload it. It will come out the top and that, that could burn you. So don't overload. Okay. I find this very satisfying. It's also good for your grip strength. It's kind of a little workout. one if you can see this the, oops, it just fell off the peel kind of sticks up here on most of them so it's easy to just grab it and throw it there even if you were using a fork I think it's still easier to peel I don't know it's not so hard to use a peeler but it's also you can just kind of let it cool a little bit but then these come right off like that I find it a little easier to peel after the fact a little less tedious I guess that's the that's the more accurate term Okay, I can do it. Let's get a close up of that. How do all of you mash your potatoes? I'm curious. David says, oh my God. <laughs> That just made me like, mm. David says he once made a quote unquote Thanksgiving shepherd's pie. It was turkey covered with sweet potatoes and candy walnuts on top. Where was I? That sounds really good. So the, the inside, I guess, was turkey in like a gravy with other vegetables and stuff. And then, oh my God, it's like everything that's good about Thanksgiving in one thing. Your candied sweet potatoes, 
You can put marshmallows on the very, no, I don't know if that would work. <laughs> marshmallows on the top. <laughs> I remember Teresa said she does not like the marshmallows on the, uh, the sweet potatoes. It is a little much, right? Okay, a few more, we're almost done with this part. David, that sounds really good. I think you need to make that this year. Three more, two, three more squeezes. And this is looking so nice. It's like just a very loose and light, with a little pile of snow. Not that we need more snow. All right. Oh. Teresa, this is smart. Teresa says she takes the easy way out and uses the KitchenAid for the mashed potatoes. That is also a good idea. And not everyone has that. So you mean like the mixer, do you, I'm wondering if you use the whisk attachment or the paddle to get the smoothest. I wonder if the whisk attachment, it might get very gluey. All right, last bit, last bit going in. David says he will definitely make that turkey good. Turkey, uh, pot pie that sounds delish something different all right that's all that's our two pounds of potatoes okay get rid of this and now so we have this fluffy um, you know handful of potatoes we're going to add a lot of butter and that's about like half a stick of butter that's a little bit more than half a stick so i find you know it's not really a science to how much butter and liquid and everything um, goes into the potatoes. You want them to feel spreadable, particularly in this case because we are spreading them, and not heavy. So I find there's like a sweet spot that you'll find uh, when you're adding, I lost my spatula, when you're adding cream and butter and salt and everything to your potatoes. All right, new spatula. Stir in the butter, and I have somewhere about two cups of half and half. So we'll start with like one cup of half and half. You could use heavy cream, you could use milk. I would not use skim milk really because you do want the fat and the richness in there. Some people say you can use like chicken stock for flavor too. Um, that's a dairy-free alternative. Well, I wanted to say if you're gluten-free, that flour could easily be like a cup-for-cup gluten-free alternative um, since we're just thickening a sauce with it. So that usually has cornstarch and things that would also thicken a sauce. That would be perfectly fine. It was not very much flour. Okay, it looks smooth. I'd say it's not quite spreadable yet. So maybe a little bit more cream. Teresa says when she does the mashed potatoes in the KitchenAid, she uses the paddle attachment. That makes sense to me. So it's sort of like mushing it as opposed to whipping it, which I think then your whisk would be totally filled with <laughs> mashed potatoes. I once tried to make, my dad uh, makes really great gnocchi. And one time I thought as a teenager that I would try to make gnocchi and surprise him. <laughs> and I thought I boiled the potatoes, which first of all is wrong because you're trying to get the moisture out of it. And then I put them in a, not the KitchenAid, but in the Cuisinart food processor and jammed up the whole thing. It was such a gooey mess. <laughs> I don't know, it was it was not successful. And that, so that's not the way to do it. <laughs> Maybe we'll make gnocchi sometime. Um, so, okay, this is starting to look lighter and you know, more, just a lighter, creamier consistency. That looks really good to me. Sue says she uses the electric, yes. Okay, that's exactly what I mean. So she uses the electric mixer. I'm assuming you mean like a hand mixer, um, but not too much because it can get gummy. That is good advice. So there are a lot of ways. You can basically, you will have something in your kitchen to make mashed potatoes. Let's taste. They could use a little bit more salt. Potatoes get that kind of sweetness and they need the salt to balance them out. 
Okay, and then we're adding our cheddar. This is the aged cheddar. That was a quarter of a pound of aged cheddar. And let's see, about a quarter cup of Parmesan. And again, any cheese really would be great. I think mozzarella might be too stringy, but any kind of grated cheese or harder cheese would be fantastic. And I'm saving a little bit of Parmesan to put on top too. Okay. So I actually never had an electric mixer, like the hand mixer until very recently. And I just found that that was one thing I was sort of missing because you don't always want to get out the big KitchenAid and um, you know, it's such a to-do, you might just want to make some whipped cream and it's a little bit easier. So that was my gift to myself quite recently. We were making something, what were we making for the video? Uh, I can't remember right now. I don't, something, was it the souffle? It must be the souffle when we whipped all those egg whites. And I was like, I need a hand mixer. Okay, this looks great. I'm gonna put a touch more cream just to lighten it up and then we'll assemble our shepherd's pie and look at the one that's already made okay if you have questions let me know i'm going on and on about equipment but i don't know it's useful information i think that looks so good i mean obviously you could just eat that by itself <laughs> okay what kind of dish the one that I'm pulling out of the oven is in like an oval baker, which I think looks very pretty. You could do this in a pie dish. You could do it in like your eight by eight or nine by nine um, brownie pan, that size. I need my paper towels. Whoops. You know, kind of any container you have would be, would be fine for this. I'm going to use a pie dish right now, this time. All right, clean up a little bit. And okay, so I have just this nice ceramic pie dish. I also have these, I got two of these recently to mix square um, cakes, and this would be a perfect size as well, although maybe not as glamorous looking. All right, so let's do this. We're going to put our mixture into the pie dish. So you, um, you don't want to press it down like a lot, but maybe just a little, a little bit so it's one cohesive type thing. finally turned off after all this time. That is one thing, even when it's not on convection, it makes a fan sound. I don't know if other ovens do that. Okay, I'm pushing this down slightly so we can put our potatoes on top and spread them around. And let's see, so like very slightly. So this mixture by itself is really good. Like the meat and the thyme together are delicious. That, sorry, now I'm talking with my mouth full. That is just very comforting flavors together already. All right, and then we're going to add a little bit of beef stock. So we're, we're kind of, this is on the drier side right now and we want it to have a gravy at the end. So I have a cup here. I'm gonna start with half a cup and see how it looks. I'm just pouring this slowly so it doesn't all just sink to the bottom slowly over the top. Kind of like when we did stuffing, I mean, you don't want it sitting in a pool of liquid, but you want it all moistened. Okay, that was about half a cup, maybe a little more. All right, and now for our potatoes. 
oh, that's my spatula. I was like, where did it go? It's in the potatoes, so I needed two. Okay. I'm like, do I have cabin fever tonight? <laughs> All right, so we're gonna do this like, um, like decorating a cake. So I'll spoon it on top and then kind of spread it around a little bit. So did I taste for, yeah, I did taste for salt. Just spoon it kind of all in the middle. That looks so good. It's like a cloud of deliciousness. Kimba said, I, I would have never guessed. Do you mean <laughs> that I have cabin fever and can't remember words tonight? Uh, <laughs> I'm like, I've been alone in my kitchen too long. All of a sudden, <laughs> I'm making up my own words. Hopefully we'll all get out of here soon. <laughs> okay, that's our beautiful potatoes. And I'm just using, you can use any spatula, but I'm just using my cake decorating offset spatula to kind of push this around. And then I like it to have like little peaks on top so it gets browned in like the peaks and valleys. But however you want to decorate it is fine or have it look. So I'll smooth it all around and then kind of go like this a little bit and get some texture on the top, hopefully. Turn. Can you even see that? There we go. I mean, this is like a rustic look, obviously, that we're going for. Okay, there we go, we did it. And I'll sprinkle a little bit of Parmesan cheese. Helene's asking, that, yes, I'm glad you brought that up. I meant to talk about that. It said, can you make two and freeze one for a later date or will the texture be off? Um, what I wanted to say before I did the potatoes was that mixture, absolutely you can make as many as you want and freeze them either in this kind of container, freeze it in a bag and then you know defrost it and make this later. So that portion certainly is due ahead. Um, potatoes sometimes do get like a funny texture when they're cold and then reheated, which I think is probably what you're asking. But I think that the amount of cream and butter and cheese in there would save it from that, like a, a, a certain degree of fat is going to make it reheatable, particularly um, under in an oven, in a hot oven where it's getting browned on the top. So the answer, the short answer to that is yes, you can definitely make these ahead and freeze. And this is another one, there were a couple things we made that were good for like a, a cabin weekend away with a lot of people. This is a good bring it with you, serves a crowd, just pop it in the oven type dish. So, okay, here's our finished um, our finished dish. So this one will go in the oven later, and I'm going to bring one out of the oven now so you can look at it and try it. So I don't know if Stacy is here. I mentioned her before, but she was asking last week about, um, you know, make ahead type entertaining things. And this is another good one. So even if you just had, um, well, no, if you're doing it the same night, you could have all of it ahead of time and then put it in the oven. Oh my God, that looks good. All right. Okay, and here is the one I made earlier. So this has been in the oven while we're, oh, yum. It's been in the oven while we're talking. And let's take a look. So these little peaks, are slightly more browned. The Parmesan on top is slightly more browned. And then this is still very tender to the touch and it smells amazing. So this is my oval, this is my oval baker that I just love. It's kind of deep and um, makes a nice presentation. Always put it on a tray of some sort. So a pie dish would go on a full size tray. This one fit on here because you can see it overflowed all the way around. You don't want that in your oven. Ooh, 
David made a like surprise emoji face and said it looks great, so thank you very much. All right, so you would take this out. This was in a 375 oven for 45 minutes, but if it's not looking browned or if you're taking it out of the fridge and it's gonna need a little extra time, just keep an eye on it. You want it to be cooked through and toasty brown on top like this. So, and then you would let it rest for about 15 minutes, but we're going to dive in together right now. I won't make you wait 15 minutes while it rests. <laughs> Teresa said, how long did you bake it? So this was it, it did sit. I turned the oven off at 45 minutes and then it's been sitting for a little while while we talk. So about 45 minutes to an hour at 375 and just check on it every once in a while. Make sure it's browning, um, you know, the way you want. Kimba says, I'm hungry. And Lynn, hello, welcome back. Says it says it looks yummy. Sue, thank you also for the compliments. It does look yummy, right? Oh my gosh. Mmm, this is making me so happy. It's always just me alone. Like no one else is eating this, right? <laughs> Except me. Um, hi, Denise. Denise said she was just typing about the baking sheet. Oh yeah, she made this tonight. Oh great. And it bubbled over and got all over the oven. Yes. So typically anything I'm cooking in ramekins, in a pie dish, in anything like that, I'm putting on a baking sheet of some sort to save the oven. And I actually, I don't know if I should admit this, I, I, I'm very into natural home things and non-toxic this and that, and I tried to clean my oven that way for a long time, and then mo recently I was like, we need to pull out the big guns, and I did like the spray, and I was like, whoa, this really works. But um, that was a result of too many times like that, cooking pizza on the rack, cooking things without the tray, just try to save yourself, you know, the aggravation. So Denise, thank you for that. Helene says it looks awesome. Thank you, thank you. All right, let's get a plate. Let's get a serving spoon. And we're going to try, I'm gonna move this onto the board so we can see what's going on. Oh, speaking of ramekins, I should mention, you know, this, of course, we did one big one, but you all know how obsessed I am with ramekins. You could do this as mini ones. You know, serve, serve your guests each sort of a ramekin, shepherd's pie as well. I've done that with um, chicken pot pies, too, for a party. Everybody had their own, which is really fun, too. Okay, let's check it out. Oh my gosh, that looks really good. I'm just gonna take a spoonful from this side so you can see without burning myself. So hopefully it's going to hold together. Whoa. Okay. It smells really good. I think I need two utensils. Kimba says, can you hear me knocking on your door? <laughs> Come over and have some. Oh my God, it looks good. All right, did not all come out at once. I'd say that's because of my deep dish here, but there we go. Kind of try to place that under. All right, so this one had a little bit more stock than the one I just did. So I'd say half a cup of stock is the magic number but there's nothing wrong with this. That looks delicious. Okay, let's try. And it's all over the board too. <laughs> okay, yum, yum, yum. It's gonna be hot again. Mm. Oh my God, it's really good. So the potatoes are very creamy. The way I just did that, it kind of all mixed together into one thing, but the potatoes are creamy. The vegetables have like a little bit of Christmas to the crispness to them still. And that lamb is delicious and savory and so good. I'm missing the peas. I do love peas, but you'll put peas in yours. That's very traditional. Mmm. Really good. Really good. Warm and cozy, 
I hope you will make this. And um, if you do, send me your questions, send me your pictures, send me your requests for future foods and videos and things that you'd like to see. And it's been my pleasure to cook with you tonight. It's been so much fun. And I thank you all for being here. And I hope to see you again next week, same time, Coco Huff on Facebook, C-O-C-O-H-O-U-G-H. -O -O -H -H. And until then, stay safe and warm. And thank you so much. Bye.